Good evening, everyone, and uh, welcome to another packed debate. Uh, the fifth edition of the Great Debate, which is the UK's only annual uh, public debate about uh, design and society. And of course, as we all know, it's part of the sixth annual Design Manchester Festival, which is now in full swing with more than 40 events in great locations around the city this week and next week. If you're interested in design and creativity, you'll want to be at our conference with uh, great speakers and immersive workshops at the Bridgewater Hall on Friday next week. The details are on the website, which is on the screen. Uh, now, our first debate, uh, great debate, took place in this very room uh, in 2014, on the very day that this building was only just pipped to the Sterling Prize, which is the, U the UK's most prestigious architectural award. And that year, we debated the Northern Powerhouse, which was then a brand new topic. More specifically, the role of design and the creative industries as an engine of growth. The next year, we debated the value of design, both economically and socially, at the Whitworth, which was actually also pipped that very week to the Sterling Prize <laughs> by another deserving building. So we were beginning to worry about the great debate curse. In 2016, we tackled city identity in the bonded warehouse at the old Granada Studios with candidate Burnham. And then last year, we came back to this very room to discuss the public realm. And that was also another great debate. But our subject this year is education and skills. Now, Brexit and Boris are not the only topics on which Michael Gove has raised eyebrows in the nation. His policies as education secretary had the effect of downgrading creative subjects such as art, design, and music, to the extent where, nationally, entry to GCSE designer technology fell by 18,800 last year and by 47,000 for creative GCSEs overall. This at a time when many creative and digital companies are worried about losing access to skilled talent from across the European Union and when we can least afford to inhibit the growth of the sector due to the skills gap. We've taken as our starting point a well-known slogan by the artist Bob and Roberta Smith. All schools should be art schools. Does that mean we want fewer scientists? Design education and pathways for talent have always been a key issue for Design Manchester. Next month, Design Manchester and Eyewear will be publishing a major book on design education. Fitness for what purpose? Edited by Mary Mullins and Christopher Frayling. Celebrating 40 years of the Samisha Black Awards, which is the world's only major award scheme for excellence in design education, the book will offer a treasure trove of thoughtful essays by some of the world's leading design educators. Now, before introducing the panel, I'm delighted that one of Design Manchester's greatest friends and supporters has agreed to say a few words to put our subject in context. In context. Uh, something that she's supreme, supremely well qualified to do as she not only runs this great institution that we stand in, which has been educating artists and designers since 1838, but has also overseen the development of Manchester's groundbreaking new home for digital storytelling, SODA, the School of Digital Arts, which opens its doors in 2021. our new School of Digital Arts, which Casper again has mentioned, with our incredible investment from Greater Manchester Combined Authority. And so this is truly going to be a, a city-wide school, a school that will sit alongside the Manchester School of Art. It won't replace it, nothing could replace it. And it will be a partnership, not just between art school, but between science and engineering and business. And it will foster the next generation of creative and digital entrepreneurs and creatives but it won't be enough because there's such a need for extra capacity in this workforce that we need to do all of us much more than that so as a country we have to become much more serious about creativity and arts-based subjects we need to give them the respect they are due and we need to do that now other major economies are clearly really understanding this and have done for a long time, like China, like Japan, who understand this 
But we have an advantage. We have 180 years of knowledge and investment, and it's essential that we address this, but we have to address it now. What's vital is that we continue to advocate for this and that we demonstrate together our values and the benefits we can bring to the economy and to ourselves as human beings. Thank you. Thank you so much, Penny, and for making time. I know that you're actually meant to be somewhere else, so really appreciate you doing that. Um, uh, so I'd like to say a special thank you not only to Penny for hosting us and for the steadfast support that we've received from Manchester School of Art at Manchester Metropolitan University right from when Design Manchester was first set up. I'd also like to thank the Arts and Humanities Research Council's Creative Economy Programme, which is sponsoring this debate, and our event partners, the All Party Parliamentary Design and Innovation Group. Now, in 1957, as uh, you'll remember, the historian A.J.P. Taylor wrote in the New York Times that Manchester is the only English city which can look London in the face, not merely as a regional capital, but as a rival version of how men should live in a community. <laughs> now, what AJP uh, failed to highlight is that, that the success and spirit of Manchester owes at least as much to women as it does to men. Uh, and so I am delighted that tonight we have no fewer than three women who were listed in Manchester Evening News' 100 inspirational women from Greater Manchester. And they are uh, Lisa O'Loughlin, the principal of uh, Manchester College, Joanne Roney, a proud Brummie, as it happens, uh, but one who in just over a year has already made a big impact as chief executive of Manchester City Council, Lou Cordwell, the CEO of Magnetic North and advisory board chair of Design Manchester. But our debate is always broader than the Manchester perspective, and I am delighted that from the national scene, we have Ellie Runcie, the Director of Growth and Innovation at the Design uh, Council, and Jack Tyndale, who manages both the All-Party Parliamentary Design and Innovation Group and the Design Commission. Ladies and gentlemen, as Jonathan Dimbleby usually says, your panel. <laughs> So if I can ask you, if you have an opinion, do please express it. This is meant to be a debate. Nobody is uh, going to be lecturing you or speaking at you. It is uh, up to you to uh, participate. Uh, so please do. Uh, there's, uh, one of us will be running down that side. Uh, Rowan will be running down that side with a, with a microphone, and, and you can have mine if you're on this side. Uh, but first, we have a question, and I'm going to ask Mary Ann Hobbs to ask it. Thank you, yeah, I've been asked to um, put this to you and I think it's a pretty good place to start actually. How do you distinguish what a creative subject actually is? Thank you very much. What is a creative subject? Is engineering creative? Lisa, what do you think? Absolutely. I think um, one of the things that I'm always surprised about when we ask what is creativity that people don't say that things like maths and physics and those kinds of things are creative because certainly at the highest level they are. Um, I'm a graduate um, of Manchester School of Art actually um, and I, I think some of the things that an arts background and uh, an arts uh, education taught me was how to research, how to experiment, how to develop and test high-level concepts and intellectual curiosity, how to collaborate, how to communicate, um, and how to produce a high-level output as well, as well as all of the things about materiality and making and all of those things that you go through in an arts education. And actually, there are many similarities in all of those skills that I believe I developed um, as an arts undergraduate and then as a postgraduate. In, in many, many subjects. So I could, I could list you dance and theatre and all, all of those things, but actually there are so many things that unite us rather than divide us from other subjects, in my humble opinion. <laughs> Ellie, what do you think? I think of it from two different angles. I think um, for my own personal uh, story, I couldn't work out what I wanted to do in life, so I did a bit of everything. I had a science a language and I kept the arts in there up, right up all the way to A level and I was a bit strange at school because everyone else was doing all the sciences or all the languages and they were quite clear about what they wanted to do 
And then I went off and I did my design degree at Brighton. And um, those were in the days where MMU now has incredible collaborations with global institutes. And back in the day when I did my degree, Brighton uh, had a collaboration here with MMU. So I had a bit of time here. We did an exchange. Um, and I was really glad. I, I studied design and I thought, I'm really glad I didn't get too early. I didn't pigeonhole myself into anything because I felt all my teachers in science were really creative. All my teachers in French and German also had to be creative to engage us in the discipline. And, and just because I was doing art as well doesn't mean it was sort of a pigeonholed activity. You know, in biology and biochemistry, we had to sketch uh, quite complex models and uh, structures at cellular levels. So, you know, we, we were, I was using all the skills across those things. And then when finally um, I ended up in my career, um, a gentleman called George Cox, who was the chairman of the Design Council, was asked to do a review of creativity in the UK. This is uh, in 2005. And uh, I think it's the closest that I've ever seen any or heard or read someone defining the role for design in creativity. And he said, any, everyone is creative. Everyone has an innate creativity in them. You know, ideas do come from everywhere. The challenge is which idea is going to be the idea that's going to deliver real value in the world. And f for us, you know, design is the link between creativity and innovation. It's the process that bridges all of us having great ideas and getting them out there into the world. So I, I would say there, there are, um, you can't, you have, it's blurring the boundaries, mm. which I think was a theme that will come up a lot this evening. Well, but dance is uh, definitely creative. Uh, is algebra, what do you think, Joanne? Is there something as a s scientific or a um, creative subject? So I read somewhere once that somebody described that the, you know, the, the real strength of education is if you learn the what, but you also learn the how. Mm. And that you need to do both. And I think the thing about creativity in its broadest sense is that you can learn the what, like dance, film, production, digital, <laughs> That's a what to me, uh, what type of a job, what type of a skill set. But creativity is about the how. How do, you, how do you think? How do you innovate? How do you change? What can you imagine? So that education for me needs to be what and how, from sand pit through to HE. So that's what I think. I think I, I agree that the distinguishing is difficult. Putting people into boxes is difficult, and this sector, this whole debate kind of falls into that trap of having boxes. Whereas I like to see creativity for me going, running through everything, a bit like the DNA of this city, actually. But so far, so far, everybody says, well, everything's creative, right? If, I, if I've more or less got that right. So why do we have a STEM debate then, or a STEAM debate? Lou, what do you think? Well, it's, I mean, it's interesting. I mean, cre creativity is always subjective, right? You know, so so we always end up in a in a conversation about what's good and bad and interesting and not, you know. So, I think defining what's creative is is probably the same. I think what's what's doubly hard is that's changing over time. Yeah. So, so when I, I, you know, I've been in the creative industries for my career for twenty five years, and actually, a lot of the things that I've moved through as industries, as they've grown up and got bought by big you know, multinationals have lost a lot of the creativity and have become like accountancy almost, you know, that there's a formula and follow the formula and, you know, pump it out of the factory. So I think, I think there's a whole generation of stuff, um, as Penny talked about at the beginning, that, that's coming through that is the next generation of creative skills. The, I suppose the commonality that, that I've seen in that time is, for me, a creative subject is something where there's an element of being able to master a craft, you know, so there's mm. something that you can do and get better at over time. Um, and there's an element of um, what, what we call in our business leap, you know, so there's a little bit of imagination or something that is illogical or just allows you to be a bit lateral. And, and, and that, I suppose, is where a bit of the magic and the creativity comes rather than just being problem solving. And, just, and design is interesting because it kind of sits somewhere in the middle of, of all of that, you know. There's, and, and actually, I would argue, um, the advent of things like service design, which for those of us who are design geeks and live in the, in the, you know, have maybe lost a little bit of the creativity in design because it's all become about maths and research and fact. When we talk about creativity, that's something that really has to start not just at primary level, but at pre 
primary level sort of kindergarten nursery. It's up there, to my mind, with the idea of problem solving, sapience. At the end of the day, that's ultimately what it is about. So just as vital to my mind as numeracy and literacy are. Um, but I think it's also the question sometimes of looking about it as design as a process and design as a solution to solving problems as well. So I think when we talk about creative subjects in the round, it's about understanding that that applies to so many things around. We were talking about dance. I mean, I suppose if we have a look at theatre, as an example of this point, you say theatre to most people, and I think the general assumption is acting. Great, fantastic, but I think you can be absolutely fantastic and effective at theatre studies without being a particularly good actor. You know, how does the play come together? Well, you know, you need people to choreograph. You need people to sort of edit scripts. You need people to oftentimes, you know, take care of lighting, to produce set design, to actually make the sets in the first place. We can't all be great actors, but I would really struggle to identify somebody who can do some part of the theatre process. You need somebody to raise the money as well. <laughs> uh, any contribution from the audience over there? Thank you. Um, I'm very curious to hear you start off this analysis looking at the subject areas. Presumably, um, you should be focused on the people who are coming to it. I'm someone from the Royal. Um, the, one of the first steps we do is we always see how, how balanced they are, right brain to left brain. Um, and I've yet to meet anyone at the polarity of it. Um, we just use it to demonstrate that we all have creativity, so we must feed everyone creativity. Um, would this be a better starting point? My name's Charles Ross. Charles. Lou, what do you think? What do you think? Yeah, I, I, I don't know. I mean, I, I don't understand the science of the brain maybe enough to know it. I think there's definitely... Um, uh, people clearly have a leaning from a fairly early age would, would be my observation but I think there's a nurture argument around that as to whether even preschool let alone once we get into school um, the creativity is embraced and grown um, <clears throat> but I think fundamentally it is in all of us but some people either don't flex that muscle or or don't recognise it has any value, you know, so it's, a, it's not a real job, which is probably what I've been told for at least 20 of my 25 years. <laughs> uh, you know, that, um, uh, so, I, so I think it's a relabeling of it rather than necessarily, oh, we've got some people in the world who are creative and some people who aren't. I think, yeah, it's a fair point. We've probably all got it in us. The question is, how do we drag it out of us and celebrate it? Yes, and I think that leads us more into some of the questions that we'll maybe explore a little yeah. later about uh, parents' influence and so forth. Does anybody else has, have anything to say on the matter of, is a subject creative? Yeah, I, mean, I think one of the problems is that in general education, you know, creativity and imagination are quite difficult words to deal with, I mean, particularly when you're building curriculums. And it becomes even more difficult when you start thinking about building curriculums in design subjects. And, you know, I'm looking at this at the moment as, as a sort of inner kind of L&T position, if you like. Um, because it's sort of non-existent in our department to a certain degree, and it's, it's got to become more robust. Um, I, think, um, I think the thing that we all have a capacity to do as human beings is that we can all imagine, and we can all be imaginative. Um, it's just that most people um, who don't consider themselves as creative um, don't think about the fact that when they use their imagination, when they make a decision to buy one pair of shoes over another pair of shoes, so that is actually a creative impulse. And it's how you harness that and how you make that a part of the sort of common way in which we use that um, innate human ability to be able to make it a, a really practical and useful thing and how we align it actually within children's sort of broader education. Um, and it starts by, you know, putting certain colour blocks together, um, creating very simple linear concepts in a simple drawing to be able to express a mental image in the mind. Um, right through to building something much more complex, um, you know, uh, a further down in their education. I do think the other thing as well is that the, obviously the really important thing about um, design and uh, the arts in general is that it's absolutely critical, and this hasn't been mentioned, to democracy. It's a very, it should be a very merit, merit, meritocratic process, and I think one of the dangers is if that's getting stripped out of the um, broader curriculum, then um, that's a very dangerous thing. 
Is it how we see ourselves? Do we understand creativity? What are the building blocks that we need? Lisa? I think the reason I started by describing the similarities between uh, creative subjects and other subjects is because I think there's a danger sometimes that we see arts-based subjects as some having some element of genius and it's over there and it's something that a tortured artist does and um, there are many of them. Um, I live with one. Room. No, uh, we, we, and it's somehow intangible and it's something that I can't be part of or don't understand. And actually, your, your comment earlier, your question at the, at the beginning was about how you build a curriculum. And actually building a curriculum for a creative subject has a huge element of process in it. It has a huge element of academic underpinning. And so when you start to think about those similarities, about that, as, as I said earlier on, the intellectual curiosity that you need to develop, the process that you need to develop, the skills you need to develop, beyond just the, you know, mastering a craft, which is, which is also important, and that leap, that, that, that element of imagination, then you can start to, I, th I think, one, see that that can be for everyone to take part in, and actually you can go along that process. They might not all be great at it, and the outputs might not all be brilliant, but actually anybody can access that. But also you can start to see um, some of the similarities to other things, that, and I, I will come on to it, I think, a little bit later in terms of the questions, but also see value in it. I, I, I'm, a, you know, I'm from a creative background myself, so I, d I don't need to understand the building blocks of the creative process to understand its value. But sometimes that can be a language that does explain it and does give it value and does create a similarity to other perhaps more valued subjects. And I think that's really important when we're exploring, building and attracting people to arts-based curriculum. Thank you very much. We'll move along, some of these points will come back in other questions, I think, but we'll move to the second question, which comes from Ed Matthews Gentle over there. Good evening. Um, I've got a question about um, future skills and workforce, I guess. Um, at a time when employees are telling us that we, we need to elevate um, the need for future workers to be brave and curious, and um, students are still in, asked to invest £9,000 a year in, in tuition fees. How important is it for degrees to teach skills that we know are in demand by employers and will lead to real jobs? So how important is it that uh, <coughs> degrees teach skills that we know are in demand by employers and will lead directly to jobs? Joanne. I had a feeling that might come to me. <laughs> um, uh, let me just quote from um, the last survey that was done in Manchester on the digital skills audit, and it was in uh, last year. 70% um, of businesses in this city um, employ graduates and attracted graduates and actively seek to attract graduates. But only 13% of those businesses think graduates have got the skills that they need. And in particular, that's around what I might call the soft skills, which actually we've just been talking about, haven't we, in that description of creativity. So I think your question's really important about if that's what employers are saying, and yet young people facing some real economic hardships have got to make choices about where they're going to choose to do their graduates, their studies. I think somehow we have got to knit to get together a better argument and a better articulation about what employers need by these softer skills. Because I think if we start, and I, that's why events like this are so important, and uh, the work that you do on the kind of design panel really, because the more we can articulate, these aren't soft as in fluffy, mm -hmm. these are skills that graduates need to have, irrespective of what specialism they might have, or what major interest they might have. They run core, I think it was the point that you made, Lou, and point Lisa made, this is about how we are valuing these skill sets and write that large for graduates to make those choices. Because for me, as a city that's growing the way it is, uh, at the pace that it is, I really need a skill system that works for young people and for employers. 
and that needs to be a better understanding from both perspectives going forward. So Lisa, uh, although you are, uh, your, uh, Manchester College is a college of further education, so maybe it doesn't apply as directly, but surely you're thinking about employability with uh, your students at all times. We actually deliver higher education as to well. 1,500 yeah. students. So we, we, we do um, deliver higher education in a further education context. And it, and it is slightly different because the students that I see come to the college, um, they have a perceived benefit or a perceived outcome in mind when they make the decision as to what they want to study and where they want to study it. And it isn't always employment. Increasingly, it is. Um, we're certainly seeing more and more of that, but it isn't always that. But there is a perceived benefit or a notion of benefit a, a, in mind at the end. I think one of the interesting, uh, there's an interesting dichotomy at the moment that more and more the education system, we, we are being geared to think about it in terms of its economic impact and what the needs of employers are and productivity and all of those things. But actually, higher education is paid for by individuals at the moment to a great degree. And the motivations are different. Um, so we see a lot of students, yes, come to us um, to, to study a higher education arts-based programme that are looking for a certain benefit. They can be different within any one group. Um, but yes, I, I think what we're seeing over time is more and more students coming to us looking for an experience um, and a process that they will go through um, during the, the course of their higher education that will set them apart in the labour market. So we're definitely seeing more of that. And I think it's crucial that we are able to um, either articulate what they are going to get that is uh, useful in many different industries or en ensure that we do embed within the curriculum that, uh, that benefit um, to distinguish them in the labour market at the end of the day. Well, Jack, I mean, in policy circles, I think there have been lots of comments by government ministers and politicians which certainly suggest that, you know, the, the university degree should be teaching directly employment, employable skills, and it tends to be a fairly two-dimensional picture that's painted often. Um, yes, and I think it's, if I can give a very political answer, in, uh, in response to that, Casper, um, I think it's, uh, to my mind, a two-point uh, program here. I think number one is actually what the nature of education, particularly higher and further education, actually is. Is it there to provide future employment and greater employability for people, or is it about developing oneself, into, you know, sort of mentally, physically, philosophically, etc., cetera, etc.? Cetera? I don't think there's any necessary contradiction there. But I think at a time when people are being asked to pay, albeit indirectly, £9,000 a year, before, and that's on top of, Jewish, uh, top of maintenance fees and everything like that, I think it's only natural that ultimately people are probably going to be a little bit more aware of what that means for their future earning powers and everything. Um, I don't necessarily think that that is a bad thing in and out of itself but I think it unquestionably is affecting how people are approaching education and certainly when people are being taught about employability, I think it's a sad rea reaction that a lot of people, and again, this is about access to education, a lot of people, particularly from first generation, their parents, families to go to university and the like, they are, sadly, I think, you're seeing this trend towards more, shall we say, practical subjects, by which I mean, you know, the accountancies, the medicines, the engineerings of the world, and sadly, less of a focus on things like fine art. And I think that's a real tragedy in and out of itself. And it's, I, think it's, I think that's been a real area of unintended consequence. However, I think connected with that as well, it does offer us this opportunity to actually talk about what the nature of education is. You know, um, uh, we heard sort of in the introductory remarks and the like about the fourth industrial revolution. The simple fact is there are people entering the university system now learning things that are, and learning skills that are going to be rendered obsolete inside of 20 or 30 years. People, you know, logistics, upwards of 90% of those jobs are simply going to disappear because of autonomous vehicles, big data and the like. What I think we should be focusing on now is this idea of continuing education, reskilling people who are in their 30s and 40s. That's going to be vital and I think that's an area where the creative industries and the creative subjects have a really powerful point uh, to play there. So I think when we took the focus on tuition fees is of course very adroit and I think very sensible, but I think we also need to focus on things like 
you know, continuing education tax credits. You effectively have a wallet where you can sort of reskill when you're in your 30s and 40s, and that's somewhere that we can have a look. And I think it's, it's the duty and the role of people in policy and academics and people in higher education to look at how we can develop those sorts of arguments. Now, now Lou, Lou, you're a creative industries employer, uh, but you also sit on the Local Enterprise Partnership Board. And I was just wondering whether your view of um, what degrees should deliver is shared by all the other people around the table at the Local Enterprise Partnership. I, I think it is because there's a, I mean, some of those industries that are around the table are kind of left, uh, not quite as far along the, the digital transformation yeah. journey mm -hmm. as others, but everybody recognises that we are in the beginning of the fourth industrial revolution, whatever that may bring. The pace of that is, is unprecedented. Every sector will be digital. Every business will be digital within the next 20 years. So, so there's a common pain point that maybe we're all feeling to, to like greater or lesser degrees, which is we've not got enough people with the right skills. So there's an obvious cavern still between higher education for, the, for those jobs where we're, we are, you know, as, as Joanne's talking about, you know, scooping and, and, ro and businesses are locating here because we've got incredible volumes and calibres of, of graduates. Um, but there's still a gap between, between what happens when they leave that institution and that place with, with their debt, you know, and begin the world of work. And I think, and I think the, somehow we have to bring those two things together, which is really easy to say and really hard to do because those industry itself struggles to tell you what skills it will need in five years. We have job descriptions in our business that didn't exist five years ago, and I couldn't have told you we would have needed those people. So it's not just a question of bringing the two things closer together. You know, business is having to move in a very agile, swift way to stay alive, let alone stay relevant. And therefore, it's very hard for academic institutions to, to follow that lead and, and to, to be joined up as a separate entity. So I think, I think the big change that, that we've seen is, you know, my generation was probably the last other generation who could, somebody else would pay for me to go and study. Therefore, I had the luxury of three or four years where I could just do something I found really interesting. And that was a, a kind of rite of passage. Now what you find, or, or I find when I talk to people who are embarking on that position, is they're having to think really, really, really hard before they go into that about what job they might have. Will this make me more or less employable to go through this three or four years and, and to come out the other end with this? You know, or would I be better to spend £10,000 starting a business? You know, so there's a, I think there's a real choice that, that people are facing because of the fact it's, it's as you say, it's their money, you know, not, not somebody else's. And I, and I think if you haven't been in the world of work, which is why things like work experience and all that kind of stuff is really important, you don't even know what half of these jobs are, let alone what they're going to be in three years. And you're trying to predict the skills you might need in four years and whether it's worth paying 50 grand to, to have them. It, it's incredibly difficult. Well, it, it sounds like uh, we're at a, a real kind of hinge moment of change, that uh, we're talking about the fourth industrial revolution, we're talking about this awareness of this, these kinds of skills that are really going to be needed, which is very much out of step with the direction of travel that, that Michael Gove's policies have led us to, is what we're saying. How, so we think that, and this seems to be the case in the region, and the industry in the region feels that, the city feels it. I'm not hearing it from Conservative Party conference. Now, why is that? Uh, do you have any thoughts on that, Ellie, maybe? Um, well, it's not coming out of government yet. No, I mean, I think the, the well, I, I think there's been, there's a step-by-step -step process here because up until five years ago, I think government saw, for example, the design industry uh, and the value and the work we used to do to sort of look at what the value is of the design industry uh, as a group of businesses and they're the employers that graduates will, will be looking for work with. Naturally, the design economy we looked at it in a different way five years ago. We said that there are design agencies, there are design intensive employers out there, and there are also design active employers out there, and there are probably more design active employers than there are design intensive. If you combine all of those things together, the design economy and its work that we've updated uh, this year is worth 85 billion to our economy, which is three quarters of the value of the financial services sector. Um, I think when you look at that then for design active businesses, 68% of that value is created by designers working in design active businesses. So for example, aerospace, financial services, automotive, um, it, sectors that really understand the value of design and they're really desperate to get 
hold of the best talent design. And, and we're not just talking about product or digital, we're talking about all the aspects of design as well. So we, I think when you've got those, that's evidence for the first time, and it's not just evidence for government, but we are, believe me, banging on doors in government to say, the evidence is here now. It isn't, it's big employers that you also listen to on other matters, but they're also telling us that uh, they need to know that there is a future pipeline of skills coming from design. And as we hear, and we will be talking about it, I know later, the, the pipeline is narrowing and they're concerned about it. And that's also why we set up a program called Design Academy, uh, which we've been running for four years and we, we're partners with MMU. Uh, we've been running that with MMU since the beginning. Um, and, and that's looking at what are the other skills then? If you think about what is it those employers need? Mm -hmm. As you said, I couldn't agree more. It, this question assumes employers know what they need. <laughs> From, from the graduates that they're trying to find. And I think what, what really it boils down to, I think the World Economic Forum uh, a couple of years ago said that there are 10 skills that people need to think about if they're employing and the graduates need to think about. Those top three are the ability to have complex problem solving skills, critical thinking and creativity. They're in the top three. And five years ago, or more than five years ago, those three skills were right at the bottom of that table. So they've shifted right to the top. So I think across any sector, those are three critical skills. And that's the reason why we've done Design Academy. And we're, we're assessing the skills of all the students that are going through Design Academy. We've supported 400 in the last four years. And, and we know that those top three skills are skills they're getting. Now, some of them are, are designers, but they're not all designers. They're coming from different disciplines on that. So at the moment, we, all we are trying to do is make sure that those skills, that, that the facts government will listen to, what, what is it that the industry is needing? And we've got that in fact, so we can't ignore it now. And I think that's usually a good starting point to talk to government. Right. Joanne? Well, I was just going to add into it that um, I think the local industrial strategy did say, uh, did set out quite clearly what some of the grand challenges were, mm. of which digital skills was writ large in yeah. saying it is recognised mm. all of the points that you made. Uh, and here, as, um, as Greater Manchester, uh, we are doing a response. We're the first area to pilot a response. I've been in this business a long time. This is the first time I've seen a proposal from government that says bring together your economic growth plans with your skills plans. Mm. Now, you'd think that was a bit obvious, wouldn't you? Yeah. But genuinely, this is the first time places are being yeah. asked to articulate explicitly yeah. our growth yeah. and our skills plans. So uh, just to come back to say, I think we are at uh, an, import, an important juncture, really, in this debate yeah. and this discussion. I also think government is listening around reform to the skills mm. sector as well. Mm. Uh, clearly, again, we have an opportunity for further devolution here, um, which we'll be working on. So I, this is critical. Mm that we yeah. address, insofar as we can, what we mean by skills gap, what yeah. we mean by uh, creative industry talent, skills, experiences, uh, problem yeah. solving. You know, what is it we're saying pe young people and our future young people need to have in those future jobs? Hard though it is, now's the time we've got to articulate it. Yeah. Um, so I think this will bring it back maybe to the first, show stand up? I can't see anyone. Um, bring it back a bit to the first question. So I think in the first question, most pan people on the panel said that all subjects can be creative. If that's the case, is there anything wrong with the system that encourages grad or people going to university to study STEM subjects if they can be really creative? Or is there anything in the kind of more traditional art subjects like art and design, which gives you more of the skill set that you were describing than can ever be possible in the STEM subject? Should creativity actually run through all of those subjects, yes. Lisa? I, th I think it, it goes back to something I said a little bit earlier about the, the, the kind of the skills that you develop that are, are absolutely fundamental to, the, uh, to creative and arts-based subjects. And you, you can't get through an arts-based subject, in, in my opinion, without the ability to problem solve, without... Um, resilience, without experimentation, we, without flexibility, without collaboration, all of those things. So whilst they exist in other subjects and they are um, they're used to greater or lesser degrees, I think in arts-based subject, you, 
the part of the process of going through that curriculum is that you learn to develop and hone and, and refine those skills and they come, become almost a part of uh, the way you think about the world. So as artists, we're taught to question, not to, eat, you know, not to accept and all of those things. That can be evident in, in other subjects, but actually the, you, you build a set of skills that, are, um, that, that become part of who you are, I think, as, as an artist. And I think it, they're also part of who we are uh, as humans, I, I would say. And I, th I think that is the difference. I think those are the huge building blocks of arts-based subjects. And they are the majority of the kind of the skills that you develop, the, 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 the significant skills that you develop in an arts-based curriculum. Thank you. Well, our next question comes from Susan Ferguson. Thank you. So I'm taking it back to uh, primary and secondary education. Uh, we talk about designing inequality of opportunity out of the system, but even if the system is completely equal, can you ever counterbalance the benefit of active and engaged parents for children who do not have that in their home background? How can we get rid of that type of inequality? Lou, what do you think? Well, in my experience, you've got to be quite an extraordinary individual to carve a career and a skill in the creative industries, whatever the creative industries is, we having had nobody in your life as a young person that was in any way involved you know that that's quite and i do know the odd person who's just you know found a library or found a book or done something and had a moment where they decided that's what they want to do but the odds are definitely stacked against you mm -hmm. if if it's alien or it's belittled or it's not encouraged and i think and and herein lies the massive problem and why we're seeing the kind of um, middle classization of, of the you know of, of the creative industries you know because it's more expensive to go and study those things for the for the pleasure of studying those things so you've got to think hard about it and actually you know it's a self-perpetuating <coughs> cycle then isn't it if the output is made by people who don't um, see the world and experience the world the way you do it doesn't talk to you and if it doesn't talk to you it's less likely to inspire you to go and want to do the same thing and so so I think we've got um, a, a problem where it's becoming fairly rapidly the domain of the elite, and, and that's a, that's um, that's a, a problem for, for somebody who wants to live in the world, you know, that, that's just made has things in it made by lots of different people. But if you're in the practice of design, especially, you need different people sat around that table shaping the thing that you are making. Otherwise, you know, as somebody said to me the other week, you know, the reason that you know silicon valley has created apps that drive you to places and apps that make food for you and bring it to your door is because it's full of 25 year old males who've left home and those are the things that they <laughs> most value so so you end up with a universe where you only see things through the lens that you see and actually great design is having lots of people with lots of different perspectives mm. shaping it and pulling it and pushing it and so 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 we not, you know, as a human being, you lose out because you don't get to see the thoughts and the, and the expression of people who think in different ways to you. But as a business, you lose out because you can only find one kind of person and they all think the same way. And, that, and that's not good for business. You know? Well, this really plays into the whole diversity debate, doesn't it? Definitely. So is there anything that we can do in schools, Joanne, to mitigate perhaps any shortcomings in the uh, family background? So, I mean, I think a couple of points on this. Um, I don't think the middle classes have got a monopoly on talent, neither do I think they have a monopoly on creativity. Yeah. I do, however, recognise that one of the key barriers and one of the big differences between uh, middle class professional households and households from more deprived communities is a vocabulary gap. Yeah. So, to answer your question, a couple of things we need to do, and we are doing, or well, three actually. One is um, the investment in early years, this is pre-school yeah. attention particularly around closing that vocabulary gap for, for, for young children. Uh, that's hugely significant here. I think we're on with doing a lot of that work. I think the second bit, um, which is helped by the kind of shifting thinking at Ofsted, is around starting to um, evaluate schools a little bit more about impact and implementation, not just grades and attainment and results. And I think that shift of the regulation framework will help 
our schools yeah. to put more effort and attention into this. And I think the third bit for me is when you talk to young people themselves, um, I think it's hard for them, for the reasons you've said, Lily, like, it's hard for them to see what types of careers exist in these industries outside of TV, film star kind of <laughs> shows, you know, but that's what, do they, what else are they exposed to? What else do they see? What else do they understand about the sector? So for me, it's, we need to work on all three of those things to equalise the system. So, Lisa, do you see your students coming from certain types of backgrounds more than others? Yeah, I, th I think there's a difference between a background where you have engaged parents and certain social and economic deprivation that some of our students uh, are experiencing. And I think the multiplier effect of the two means you are absolutely up against it. So I think... The idea of engaged parents, I think you do have a, a, the potential to enter the creative industries from a background where your parents actually don't really, not, not really interested in the arts or, or really interested in creative industries. If you are in a, in a household that isn't experienced ec economic de deprivation, I think you can enter those industries. And actually, some some. We, we do profile our students in all different ways. Some students aren't influenced by their parents at all. They actually want to go in the opposite direction. <laughs> so I think, I think you can um, <laughs> enter the creative industries from backgrounds where parents aren't engaged in the arts. But if you, if you are from a background where your parents aren't engaged in the arts and you're experiencing social and economic deprivation, then you're really, really up against it. And that's the thing that we've got to address because frankly the system isn't equal, um, and the, the, it, it truly isn't. Just thinking about um, a, the background I came from, which was an extremely low working class background, and I too, I too was in the, the last year to go through having a grant. Remember those? They were fantastic. <laughs> um, we, uh, subsistence grant and everything, it was fabulous. Um, and, and there is absolutely no way I would have been able to pursue an arts education if it hadn't been for that grant, there was absolutely no way. Not because my parents didn't believe in my abilities, not because my parents weren't interested in the arts or didn't see the potential of an arts-based education to actually put me in, into a, a range of different settings. Arts-based education is a great preparation for being a principal of a college. Um, but, but because there was just such a huge economic um, driver in our household, so that, that, that would have been a huge barrier to us. Mm. Uh, is there a role for policy? Can Parliament help, do you think? Well, I mean, I think a lot of this gets down to, uh, I think particularly from a um, political point of view, but I think, uh, to be honest, it, it's also somewhat pronounced with um, um, certain parents as well, is one of the inherent contradictions we have in the British education system, I think, in terms of what people want to get out of it. And I think, particularly from a po political part side of things, it's you're wanting to have, you know, the structured, regimented, once that, you know, sort of like exam-focused, results-orientated approach that you have in Singapore, whilst having, you know, the same level of freedom and creativity and focus on, you know, multitude areas that you have in Finland. And I think this is one of the real difficulties where you, you, you can't have a Swedish model and get Finnish outcomes or vice versa. So I think there's a real sort of challenge in that area. And I think as a result of that, it, it sort of goes back to the wider example. And again, I, I couldn't agree more uh, with regard to, um, you know, out, basically someone's future in life pretty much being set by the time they actually get to primary school in the first place. I mean, Julian Legrand, who's a lecturer in social policy, points this out as well. You know, every single study you can have a look at is, but by the time you sort of leave nursery and you go into year one, you, you can pretty much within about 90 degree descent of accuracy tell whether someone's going to go to university, whether, going, that, whether or not they're going to sort of have like a middle class or even an upper class sort of level of career trajectory and everything like that. That's something that I think we really need to recognise. So I think, you know, taking this back into, you know, this idea of, you know, equality of opportunity is again, to my mind, points out, you know, we're saying should all schools be art schools? Well, to my mind as well, again, what sort of nature for British education do we want? Because we have a national curriculum, and if you go back and talk to Lord Baker about this, 
Lord Baker, you know, introduced the national curriculum 1992, 1994. It's now quite openly, yeah, I wouldn't do that these days. So what do we do in that respect? You know, if policymakers can't decide to change their mind after 20 years, well, we're going to really struggle to get kids to go through it in 20 years as well. Well, they're probably going to do that on Brexit, aren't they? Uh, anyway, not, not on that subject yet. Uh, so, uh, Ellie, uh, nature, nurture, what is it? I mean, I, yeah, I think the thinking about this one, I think it, you have to have both. I think it's, it's, you need both in equal measure. I think also uh, when you're at school in formative years, you, you need good role models. As you said, you know, I, I didn't know what I wanted to do. Uh, and I kind of, I wasn't sure it would go down well if I ended up going down a design path, because in those days it wasn't seen to be, you know, a very good career, you know, it's a bit risky. Um, but it was great. I had role models, one in the school and one um, who had sort of forged their way in the fashion world. They weren't a household name at all, but I was just really impressed by them as a person. And I think it's the people around you in your network that can inspire you and at, at all ages and stages. Uh, I'll never forget Mrs. Stokes, my art teacher. You know, I can see her now in my, at primary school. And so these pe there are people in the system who are your inspiration, your role models, and we need more of them. And, and they need to probably mirror more uh, diverse um, areas of society so, you know, that we're, we're getting people that everyone can relate to, not, not just a sort of middle class few. I think the point that you've just made, which is about inspirational teachers, is really the answer to how can we mitigate uh, yeah. that shortcoming. And we all know, we, we, we all know them, we all remember them, don't we? Yeah. So, but we were talking there about uh, parents in terms of the nurturing environment. I'd just like to shift the focus slightly to the next question, which also relates to parents, but slightly in a different way. Zoe. Mm. Zoe Asian. Hi. Um, yeah, I thought that too. Uh, so the question I have is, uh, is kind of moved slightly away from this now. I feel like we've discussed it. Um, and it's looking at the expectation of parents and it should the onus be on them. But I wanted to kind of add a little bit more to this, which was especially around the socioeconomic diversity that was mentioned. So there's a lot of talk about parents um, and putting a lot of pressure on them. Um, obviously, some people um, that I work with, they come from care, so they don't have parents, they're from, they need guardians. Um, and I think my question would be around, you know, who in our community beyond parents could we start to kind of look at building a mindset and helping sort of that expectation that perhaps young people could go to sort of outside of their family unit? Uh, Ellie. I think this is about um, understanding in the public about design or about the arts and what, what it means. And ironically, I spent the day yesterday with about 30 scientists who were having the same debate about engaging the public and engaging parents to inspire young people to go into science because the word is off-putting or it's an intimidating subject they think means something else. So, I mean, I, I think on this point... We find all the time, um, and increasingly, we're doing more work with the third sector, with charities, with communities. A lot of the work I've been doing at the Design Council in Innovation for at least 15 years has been with industry. And in about 2008, 2010, we started moving into the public sector. Today, we're working with carers, we're working with volunteers in the community. We're working in, in Halifax on a big program there to get... Halifax Calderdale more active. It, it's a big sport England program. There are parents in the room. There are carers in the room. There are GPs, social workers, um, hospital staff, but there are people who, in their later, later years in the room just because they want to come along and be to do what they can do for their community. And it's an extraordinary program because we, everyone is using design as an approach to take a step back and think, how can we do better together as a community. I think, I think the, that is a powerful thing about design. It actually does bring people together and it enables people to have a different kind of conversation. And what's happening through that work is that people, everyone like us, who's, who maybe hasn't come across something like design or even the arts before, is saying, this has been an extraordinary experience. You know, and I, and I didn't think that's what design was at all. And, but all of these people are, are influential people in their own communities. And I think this is all part and parcel of the wider question beyond parents is, is who else is in your immediate network. If they see design 
as it truly is and not what they think it might be, something to do with sort of pretty objects and, and it's an exclusive mm -hmm. thing over here and it's fashion, fashion designer famous names and catwalks, everything else. It, it, it can be those things, but it's actually a lot more than those things. And I think that is the thing that it all comes back to is it really is addressing people's needs. You know, a good designer is people-centered. They understand that the, they've created something that's going to improve someone's life. And that, that is at the heart of the question for me. So, uh, jo Joanne, um, do you think that uh, p parents, well, we were talking earlier about how parents often, the children want to do the right opposite of what uh, they're <laughs> suggesting, but nevertheless, do you think parents are an important audience for us to try and change oh. minds in the system? Uh, well, it's not going to hurt, is it? So, you know, for all the reasons we've just said, getting um, proper conversations in communities with parents and with children to value design and creativity and what it leads to has to be key. I think we do some really interesting um, work here with businesses in schools, actually, which is changing perceptions for young people. Because actually, one of the biggest influences on young people is other young people. Mm -hmm. And so getting young people to articulate their enthusiasm, their excitement, their desires, their passions, mm -hmm. starts to make it OK, starts to ignite it. So I actually think you do start with young people themselves. Um, somebody mentioned um, future work and employment and uh, logistics was mentioned and I was fascinated to see um, a piece of work that's going on in the city at the minute with a construction company who are working in schools but they're talking about logistics and construction but they're doing it through virtual reality headsets mm -hmm. on young people and they're telling the children that um, actually the way you operate cranes now is through virtual reality headsets so when you see the 64 cranes in Manchester today that is not being operated by manual crane drivers anymore. It's done by somebody sat in a lovely office block um, with a virtual headset on, moving blocks. Of stuff. Uh, the young people were just blown away by that, just that session. Yeah. So there is something about uh, igniting young yeah. people's passions yeah, in the school place through work to get them to see that game they're playing that's the chief executive next, you know, that's the chief executive in the making, isn't it? Mm. Yeah, they, they, so we've got to do that with young people, would be my view, not just parents. Mm. Right, well, I think I'm going to move on because we are going to run short of time and there's a few more questions that we want to come to. Uh, so I'm going to ask Tony Walsh to ask the next question. Hi, uh, good evening. With uh, what we're hearing about uh, the reduction in social mobility, can I ask, please, what pathways, what practical pathways into the creative industries do we need to attract the best talent from all backgrounds? So this is really back to that initial diversity question. How do we get the best talent from all backgrounds into the creative industries? Lou. So um, for me, this is the old ad. You've got to see it to be it. Right? You know, so, so unless you can see somebody who talks a bit like you or looks a bit like you or comes from somewhere you recognise, it remains the domain of somebody else, you know, or that's something that somebody else does. And in the same way, Joanne's describing also all the jobs you don't even know exist, that you might go, I didn't even know that job existed, I'd love to do that, or I think I'd be great at that job. So I think, I think it's exposure, which I know, I know Joanne and, and the city are really passionate about trying to find different ways, which is not just about work experience, it's yeah. about work shadowing, you know, just sit next to somebody. Yeah whilst they do their job rather than the pressure, which is a pressure in a small business of saying, you've got this young person for two weeks, and it's like, yeah. oh, what am I gonna do with them tomorrow? You know, like, I've run out of things to do, you know. Yeah. So, so, so actually just giving people the opportunity to, you know, which is, I, I started, I, I offered to photocopy for free in anybody's creative business that would have me, and I just stood over the <laughs> photocopy and had a look at what people were doing, and I thought, that looks like a rubbish job, and they look like a bit of a toss-up. Oh, I like them, <laughs> they? You know, so, and, and I think you've got to be in the environment to just see see what you know, some spark somewhere that if you've not got that influence in school or at home or wherever, that, that just might ignite something that you know gives you the opportunity to pursue. So I think then then what we can do in education is to hopefully recognise that and, and and nurture that and, and and give people the opportunity. But I think it's all about exposure. So this thing actually about getting balance, you know, gender balance and ethnic balance and community balance, all those types of things, yeah. is about creating the right picture so that everybody can relate to it. I mean, we have a situation in which 80% of the 
of the uh, tech, digital tech yeah. industry in the region is, is male. Yeah. Uh, and, and a similar percentage is, is, is white. Yeah. Now, I know that uh, the, digital, the new digital strategy is setting a target for this to be 50-50 male-female by 2022, which I think is Absolutely. a very ambitious target, but a great target to have That's if we right. know how we're going to deliver it. So the question uh, actually is, you know, is what can we do to, to open up to all talents from whatever backgrounds? Lisa? I think, I think you're right. I think you hit on something there about um, being able to recognise somebody like yourself um, that is, is visible, if you will, in, in the arts. But I think visibility, and I come, come back to what Lou said uh, earlier on, let, let's make arts visible in all communities, in all, in all aspects of society. And I think it, there is an obsession at the moment with celebrity. And, you know, we, we talk about um, uh, how much creative industries actually contributes to the economy, and we start talking about pop stars and all of these people. Well, you know, how many people are really going? And yes, of course, there are those exceptions and there are those people. But I think there, there are people doing some fantastic work and I'm really pleased to see Ed in the, in the audience, but there, 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 are, there is work going on in communities all around the country where you, you have um, local artists, you have arts communities, you have arts festivals, and I think making visible art and creative industries in all of those settings, and particularly in those settings where, the, like the one that I grew up where my dad was a joiner, my mum was a seamstress, and I wanted to be a fashion designer, and I might as well have been an alien from outer space, you know, because they used to say, yeah, she's not like us, Lisa, is she? No, she's not like us. And, and you need that exposure to um, what, what might that look like for me. You need, um, yeah, that passion ign igniting, but also to be able to see a pathway through it, to be able to see, actually, I can fit into this, I can be part of this and actually convince my parents as well that I'm not, I've not gone mad or, or whatever it is. And I, th I think visibility is the key, but it, it's not just, I'm, I'm a huge advocate of work experience, but it's not just about that. I think there are lots of other ways that we can expose young people to the creative arts and make that visible and a pathway visible to them. Mm -hmm. yeah. Now, Ellie, you were talking about um, how big the uh, GVA is of design. Uh, in, in the economy, how big a contribution it makes. Is there a dividend to be had uh, you know, if we're more diverse and more open? I know the McKinsey diversity report a few years ago really said that actually companies that are more diverse are more successful. Is that, so uh, how much would it be if actually we were diverse from the 85 billion we're currently delivering? Double, obviously. In the next five <laughs> years when we next do design economy, probably will triple. <laughs> I mean, we have, we have looked at businesses that have actually employed designers that weren't going to. We, we worked with 5,000 SMEs, almost, I mean, Ed will remember uh, the work we did over a 10-year period. So we were we were trying to recruit businesses who were kind of, uh, oh, I, don't, I hope that's not a symbolic thing. Um, <laughs> uh, sort of healthily skeptical about design and working with designers, because it was a bit, well, you know, I think it's just about making stuff look nice. And maybe this is slightly off piece, but, you know, those 5,000 businesses are surviving and growing and contributing to productivity 91% uh, faster than the national average. So we've done a bit of research with a control group, and so it's 91% surviving and thriving compared to 47% in a control group nationally. So I think when you start to look at that, we've consciously worked with those businesses. We, we've, they've been all over the country. We're, we're putting them together with, with not just um, designers, but all kinds of designers they would never have worked with. Um, but the way we've done that is not, it's building on the what and the how, mm -hmm. going back to your point. We're making them take a step back and ask the question why, because I think that is something that uh, when you're young and, and the whole process about art and design, you know, we, we should be really forcing people to ask, not always just the what and the how, but why are we doing this? What's the big question that this is the right answer to? And I think if if businesses realise the role, the massive role design can play there, then they will take it seriously. And yeah, we'll, we will definitely beat those figures. But um, I wouldn't dare put a figure on it. <laughs> but you know, we can start you're not to a see. Politician. We can start to see, but by tracking the performance of certainly smaller businesses, smaller and medium sites. Well, let's face it; they're the lifeblood of our economy. It isn't yeah. just large employers and a lot of design employers are SMEs too. 
So we need to look at how well they're doing. When you do match them together with people they wouldn't have worked with, yeah, they do survive and they thrive. Well, that's well, so interesting what in as well. House, so, sorry. Just on that point, Casper, I think that, I mean, the, the SMEs being the lifeblood, they're also the lifeblood in the industrial strategy. Yeah, and actually, you know, so. that, that role for design mm. then in accelerating those SMEs towards, you know, what industrial strategy sets out to deliver, yeah. I think is, you know, and then notice the lack of, how many times the word design is mentioned in industrial strategy? You know, there's not enough of that there is brought to the top as a as a key horizontal driver. You know? I mean, I'm not sure Jack will probably be able to say more about this, but that was all put together in quite a short space of time. And I think you know, you notice the grand challenges haven't yet been announced. So I, I think yeah. that that there are departments coming together around the grand challenges now, saying, okay, if we're looking at aging society, if we're looking at clean growth, if we're looking yeah. at mobility. What are the cross-cutting needs for those? And they are involving design in the debate for that, which is starting, as you said earlier, I think there are positive... So are we picking there. this up in the local industrial strategy and are we doing everything in the city that we can, Joanne, to Obviously. solve it all? <laughs> Obviously. I mean, this is, uh, the answer to that is yes, but uh, as I said at the start, you know, this is the first time we've been asked to put together mm. a local industrial strategy. And, and, and you've got to make it real mm. and we've got to make it distinct it's got to be something that anybody in my view anybody's got to pick it up and go yeah that's Manchester yeah. that's got the DNA of Manchester in it mm -hmm. so for that reason it absolutely I'm sure will have culture and, uh, in its broadest sense and design and digital writ large in it because it is in the DNA of this city even though it is one of the fastest growing economic sectors even though it is uh, one of the major contributors to the economy it is more than that and we want it to be more than that but writing this strategy, um, I'm glad I'm not doing it because <laughs> it's got to kind of be done on a limited format. And oh gosh, how do we, how, how do we capture and prioritise mm. the response to all of the challenges that we face? Uh, it's it's going to be great. <laughs> I'm Indeed, it's going to be brilliant. Jack, how does it play into uh, I, I mean, I was going to say, and I, I couldn't agree more in that respect. And obviously, picking up the point you made, um, no, quite a few about. Um, you know, the nature of design being dominated not just by SMEs, but by micro-businesses. I mean, you're yeah. technically not an SME unless you employ more than, I think, uh, yeah. seven to ten people. The average size of a design firm in this country is six. The other, and I think connected with that as well, when we're talking, you know, we've been talking quite a bit about stuff like the Northern Powerhouse and regional economic growth. One of the real strengths of the design sector in this country is how nationwide it is, you know, if you're setting up a large factory or something like that, you know, you need to talk, think a lot more about, you know, logistics, connections, you know, tra uh, you know, railway lines, big motorways, everything like that. If you're creative and you have a, a good idea, a good concept, you can really set up a design firm if you've got the drive in the spare room, effectively. And I think, you know, as well, one of the real strengths, I think, that when we talk about the industrial strategy is this ability that we can talk about playing to our local strengths as well. I think it's just as much about specification. I mean, if I can, go, like, if I can take us to the other side of the Pennines, uh, I'm from Barnsley originally. I know I sound a little bit like Melvin Bragg before I had the operation, but nevertheless, <laughs> you know, one of the things, but my, I mean, my dad was a steel worker uh, originally. We trained to be a technology teacher, but Sheffield Steel Producers, uh, the best quality steel in the world, and we should be very proud of that. And, you know, that is manufacturing, but it is design. It's about creativity. There's some absolutely gorgeous colour. You can go to the Millennium Galleries in Sheffield. I would encourage you all to do so. They're still making some absolutely fantastic metalwork. And again, that's something that we still have a competitive advantage in. And again, when we're talking about nature nurture here, yeah, my dad left school at 15, uh, you know, one of about eight kids. I can still remember what hooked me on design was when we uh, went up to have a little trip to Glasgow. Uh, we went in the Kelling Grove and my dad took me and he showed me Dali's uh, portrait of the crucifixion, you know, it's Christ suspended from above and the trapezoid and that's just one of the formulative years of my life. I was eight and I can still remember that and I think that's what got me into design and that's what got me into the creative industry. So, like, if, you know, the steel worker from Barnsley can do that, I think there's no shortage of what formulative ideas like that can do for us. Great. Well, it just goes to show how a moment can change things. Uh, Tony, you have a question. Um, we, we've lost Tony Wilson, Anthony H. Wilson. Um, I'd like to think if he was still with us, he'd be here this evening. And if, if he would, what would he be saying? And I don't want to put words in his mouth, but he, he might, I think, say something like, we're in Manchester, a, a city famous for its radicalism. 
and we're in its School of Art and Design, uh, which should be a hotbed of radical ideas. <laughs> And I'm sat here listening and wondering if somebody walking into the room now might forgive them for thinking we're having the debate, should all schools be business schools? And coming to the conclusion, <laughs> yes, and business needs designers. I'm hearing a lot about design and not much about art. Well, I'm hearing a lot about business growth and economic growth, and we can debate the sustainability of those on a, on a finite planet. And I'm hearing nothing about human growth. Um, the, we used to call these things the humanities. If you go to Oldham and stand outside their fantastic modern library and look across to their red brick Victorian library, it says arts and science carved in stone on high as equals. And we've, we've lost sight of those things. And I, for one, we've got the word rebellion on the, uh, on the screen there. I, for one, would be interested in... I'm, I'm enjoying this debate. It's important as a full-time artist myself. I, I'm a limited company. I, I, I get that. But I'd also uh, be interested in debate in an art school of all places that's about human growth as well as business growth and economic growth. Well, it is, it's very true that in the 70s and 80s, <laughs> there's some resonance there. Uh, very true in the 70s and 80s, there was quite a lot of disruption and it happened in the music industry. Tony Wilson certainly a very big part of that. And that played a big part in, in what we are now, disruption which is actually the theme of our festival this year, is uh, also at the heart of, te of technology and, and of digital. So uh, do we need disruption that actually really challenges as well as disruption that just breaks the technology or the method? Joanne? Um, well, I'm all for disruption that um, transforms people's lives and enriches people's lives. I'm very conscious every panellist on here has kind of told their personal story. Well, it's not just because you've asked the question, Tony, but I wanted to be a poet when I was 11. I still, and there's still time. Um, so I absolutely agree with the fact that we mustn't lose sight that it's, it's, it, there is that element of human enrichment. And through that, through art, people can find their way into different walks of life, different experiences, different thinking. So it could lead on to a job, it might not lead on to a job, who knows if I'll ever become a poet. Um, but but I, I absolutely agree with that point. It? And we, we mustn't just see this as an economic conversation, mm. actually, although we've talked about jobs and skills. Um, I, I don't think I, I see it like that, and I don't think the DNA of Manchester has it just in a box like that. I think it is broader. Lisa, disruption? Yeah, I, Tony, I agree with you. I, I'd, I'd love to be here, sat here, talking about um, education for its own sake, art for its own sake, what it means to be creative and what, uh, how central it is to our hum humanity. And, and I actually believe in all of those things, Tony. Uh, and I know you do because I've heard you um, speak on it passionately. But, unfortunately, we are, we, you have to see art, and particularly arts education, in the context within which it sits. And unfortunately, in, in a neoliberal age of higher education in particular, uh, we are in a situation where someone's paying for that education at the moment. And it does bring into play, I don't, I don't like it, you know, I, I, it, it doesn't sit well with me. I train to be, after all the crisis, so I train to be an educator first before I started to think about where the money was coming from and who was paying for it. But unfortunately, that's a necessity in our society and then that does draw into the conversation all those other things about benefit and what, what does that do for me and how do I live and how do I make my way in the world. And unfortunately, I think context um, is why we are talking so much about all of those other things that sit um, around an arts education. Thank you. Well, it's been so, so uh, great, this discourse, that we are beginning to run short of time. So we only have time for one more question, and we're going to do it on a subject that is certainly disruptive. Can I ask Malcolm to ask a question? <laughs> Thanks, Casper. Thanks, uh, Malcolm would like break. Well, <laughs> I'm going to talk about the elephant um, in the room. Um, anybody who follows me on social media will know that I'm not a fan of Brexit. <laughs> So inevitably, I get the Brexit question. Um, does the panel think, <laughs> no, uh, will the impact, what will be the impact of Brexit?
both on the prospects for the creative industries themselves and the career prospects of young people. Is it going to be good or bad? So, Jack, if you kindly just give us the answer. Oh, right. <laughs> <laughs> um, no pressure. I don't know if anyone's checked the, uh, like, Twitter recently. Um, I've got no idea if the government's collapsed or not. I mean, as far as I know, the crunch talks were still happening in number 10. Um, yeah. No, there we go. <laughs> no one's admitted. There's a, um, I mean, there's a... Uh, Japanese ceramic technique called um, Ushanki, which where in, you take broken crockery and you replace it with, and you sort of fix it using um, a sort of gold or platinum or silver or something like that. And the idea is that you can take something broken and turn it into something even more beautiful. Um, not entirely sure that that analogy applies to Brexit, <laughs> but nevertheless, let's wait and see. Um, I mean, I, I suppose if I'm going to be, I mean, of course, I, I think the important thing from my perspective, you know, like I economic historian uh, by background, and one thing that I think's always been the case, uh, talking about societal change and economic change, is that um, things that appear to be very big at the time, oftentimes don't end up being nearly significant 30, 40 years down the line as you think they are. Um, what I will say, of course, is that there's absolutely no doubt in my mind that any Brexit of any type is going to be disruptive, I think largely disruptive, on the negative, uh, for people now, we've been talking about access to opportunities and stuff like that. Um, frankly, um, like any sort of like Brexit deal that sort of disrupts something like access to Erasmus, you know, that's played an absolutely vital role in students at universities being able to go and sort of study abroad, visit other European countries, soak up other European culture. Um, it, it's been the egalitarian and the meritocratic version of the old-fashioned grand tour. If that's going to go away, that's obviously going to be disruptive. That's before we get into the myriad of stuff that I could also talk about, access to funding, uh, Horizon 2020. Um, uh, 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 and there are the many other things the that could be system. said. I, 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 just <laughs> but, what, but what I will say is, and maybe it's the slight note of uh, optimism, and I think we should always finish, well, I'd like to finish from my point of view on a slightly optimistic note, which is, um, we've talked so much about the future of stuff like the fourth industrial revolution, et cetera, et cetera. Frankly, the amount of economic disruption that even the hardest of hard Brexit, full WTO rules is going to cause to GDP, that's dwarfed by the effect that automation and the like is going to have the economy for good or ill. The problem is, as far as I can see it, in 30 years down the line, you know, I'm, you know I, I don't even want to consider what my life's going to be Let's like. Let's do that debate on fourth industrial revolution next year. Yeah. <laughs> Meanwhile, Lisa. But there we are. Um, in the meantime, it's going to be a lot more damaging and disruptive in the short and medium term. Yeah. I'm but going, there we to, go. going to ask for a, a, a quick input on, on Brexit. Tony, you asked for disruption, Brexit's it. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, I think uh, one, one thing that's in, an interesting consequence of um, pre-Brexit, and who knows whether we'll get there or not, um, is that further education is having a renaissance, which is interesting, and it's the first time in 20 years um, a government department have come up to the Manchester College, or any college I've been involved in, to ask us how they can fund us better, um, which is uh, the fir literally the first time in, in a very, very long time. I think one of the things that... Um, there are good things in everything, aren't there? And, and one of the, trying to be optimistic, one of the things that certainly has been an impact of Brexit is an understanding that we need to um, start to think about how we're going to invest in those skills that we're going to lose okay. through yeah. Brexit. And that is something that we're starting to have conversations about. I hope that that will create better opportunities for young people to be able to access arts or, um, education particularly from the backgrounds we've talked about and within the context we've talked about, um, because it will open the doors for them um, if, if it is funded. Yes, it's something we'd have to make happen. Joanne? Yeah. Uh, some quick points. Um, absolutely agree the point about skills at the forefront of our uh, things that we're anxious about. Um, the role of universities and the link that between our universities here and SMEs in particular uh, in order to accelerate the growth as fast as we can. Uh, is incredibly important. Likewise, our international connections will become even stronger in the city and even more significant. Um, 
two quick points for me. Um, I was quite struck by um, one of the announcements from government around the Festival of Britain as being some sort of solution for Brexit. <laughs> Clearly, I'm politically neutral, so all I'm going to say about that is thank goodness we have the Manchester International Festival <laughs> and thank goodness that we here in this city um, have significant investment on the cards for uh, culture, arts, growth in these sectors. The opening of the festival, the, sorry, the factory in 2021. Uh, I think we have the largest investment in arts and culture anywhere in the UK that's taking place. And for me, that's the positive we should end on, that notwithstanding all these challenges and the challenges to come, this is a place that recognises the contribution of this sector in its broadest, um, its broadest definition. Ellie, Brexit, what do you think of it? I mean, I agree that I think you know, we need to look at the skills that are at risk and that we're going to lose, but I can't separate that out from Industry 4.0 either. I can't wait for next year. I need to say, you know, design skills, art skills, these are skills that can't be automated, so we know they've got huge potential. And whatever the outcome of Brexit, you know, it, it's a global world. Where it's, it's a global economy that we're looking at as well as, you know, whatever Europe means, we have to think about maintaining our edge, I think is a choice, a destination for people to come and be educated here and grow their careers here, as much as it is for young people to have careers elsewhere in the world. And I think, you know, we are still, I think, sixth in the world as a destination of choice and as, as an exporter, you know, of design products and services. So I, I think, you know, that, that's something we have to focus on building on and not, you know, focusing just on the outcome of Brexit. We've got to keep, yeah. keep going. So, Lou, can you end us on a positive note with that? I'm trying. <laughs> <laughs> I think, okay, if we're going to see a positive, then I think, um, you know, let, let's push aside the economic hardship and the fact we haven't got enough, enough people with the right skills already. I think um, strange things happen, don't they, in moments of crisis, you know. So, I remember reading a brilliant article by, um, that talked about Jim Henson, and, and he was saying he could only have made the Muppets and created all those things at a point when people were so on the knees that they needed to believe in something so fantastical and imaginative and, and there it was you know and so so I think I think what we do need to recognize is I don't know if anybody saw the um, Jack Ma uh, uh, the kind of exiting CEO of Alibaba who's now you know a gazillionaire and leaving never really thought he would retire to a beach and he's gone back to teaching which is where he began his career and he, and he wants to teach people creativity and 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 he's really, you know, for him, he's saying we've got to recognise all the things the machines will do mm. and will take over and be brilliant at the things that don't. And I think, I think one of the things Tony, you know, was, was passionate about was us exporting to the world Manchester's incredible creativity. And, 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 and I think if we can do that again, you know, that's what we need. We need to create IP. We need to create value. We don't want to be anybody's cheap production unit. We want to be making the ideas and the output of, of all different kinds here and I think if we can do that then you know we're going to do it in a market where we need to be exporting something that everybody needs and and you know as, as Penny said we've got hundreds of years of heritage in this right so we should be better than anybody in the world so I think British creativity and Mancunian creativity you know should be a nice valuable commodity in a post-Brexit universe. Well thank you very much I think it is a great thing that we come together every year as a design community and talk about design and society. It's been a really great debate this evening and I, we, it will be a podcast and we'll send you all an email so that you can, you can listen to yourselves. Uh, and it's been so great, not least because we've had such a fantastic panel. So I'd like to thank you very much indeed. So I hope you can all join us for a drink immediately outside. Oh,